Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the 58th edition of the Frank and Stan chat. And uh, yes, we have a, a guest with us this week. Um, Susan Brickell is going to be joining us. Hello, Susan. Hello. Hi. Nice to see you both. No, well, it's great. It's great to have you here. And th there he is, Stan. You're back at home. Yeah, for the for the near future, yeah, I think uh, the popularity of the of staying in Wales has now gone through the family. So I probably won't see the inside of the caravan for some time. <laughs> well, I'll be I'll be back at home next week. I'm I'm in Wales this week, um, but I'll be back in the little study um, next week uh, where we've got I think Emma Ainsworth joining us. So, um, but anyway, hopefully we'll have a, a very secure signal. Um, today to make sure that this recording runs smoothly but uh, if we have any any problems it's likely to be at my end rather than uh, anybody else's so uh, Susan would you like to just uh, because we know I know you very well but uh, can you just explain to people who don't know you who you are and what you do yes yeah, so um my name's Susan and I am a chair of governors well the reason I'm here is um I'm a chair of governors of two schools um at the moment uh um academy Manchester academy um part of United Learning Trust and St Thomas's C of E primary in Stockport um I have been a governor for almost 18 years and a chair of governors for about 12 years um and uh yeah I, I talk a lot about it tweet a lot about it so I think um yeah that uh Frank asked me along that's, yeah yeah that's nice. and, and I, I I know uh Susan lives quite close to where I live and so we've we we know each other outside of all of this and uh but I, I felt as though I think we've always felt as though um and I think I made the point last week that there's a real risk that unless we actually sort of make sure that we are connected into people who are actually working in schools, you know, there's a real risk that we, Stan and I can be sort of a little bit sort of um, you know, hypothetical or whatever, but, um, but anyway, so we're, we're very keen to make sure that we're rooted in the current and uh, we're very keen to hear what you've got to say about what life has been like as a governor over the last okay. 18 months or so. So uh, let's start, first of all, should we go to Stan first with what's caught your eye this week? Perhaps not. I'm just amazed that you could substitute geography for history, for English, for anything else, and, and it, it, it doesn't say anything really that, that you wouldn't know it, but it says it in the most complicated way it possibly can. Uh, but the, the thing that got to me was the the phrases, the use of the word knowledge and knowledge to be learnt is, is mm -hmm. in it time and time again. Knowledge to be learnt. And then contradictorily towards the end, it says that, that, that children should know to challenge knowledge, to, to, to have the skills and wherewithal to challenge what is known. Well, I don't think you can have that both ways. You either challenge it from the start or you don't say these things have got to be learned. And when you've learned them all, then you can think about challenging them. It, it, it's, I found it contradictory. And I also found the, the way it described a uh, topic approach with some level of derision uh, because it's not disciplined enough for, for the geography specialist to be able to deal with. Uh, and then big sections of it talk about the in interconnectedness of geography with other subjects, which to me makes a topic approach the better way of approaching it. But who yeah. am I? Yeah, I mean, this is we're 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 in a sort of um, we're on the one extreme here, aren't we? On the knowledge debate, yeah. we are we are being hounded and pushed and shoved into that sort of area. And you know, I think that when I, when I was devising those frameworks, you know, we always talked about knowledge, skills and understanding. And and since in a sort of as if they're one didn't trump the other, they're, you know, in effect, they're all needed, you know, in order to, yeah. to sort of really sort of get a sense of what that curriculum should be like. Um, and then since then, you know, somebody said, well, perhaps you need to emphasize the sort of behaviors as well, because having all of that, the knowledge, skills and understanding, but not actually having the behaviors, and, the, and the, the way in which you can work with others, you know, that actually feels as though because there's the the geographical skills, but there's also the 
the human skills you know that that actually are sort of central to to effective sort of civil society and stuff like that which actually you know i mustn't forget so i always throw in that behaviors element to cover that but we're really being hammered and it and it's it feels political as well that's the thing for me um, i just i just cry for experience tell me what the experience of the child learning is and you know I, I did, I've not finished reading the whole thing, to be fair, but when I got to the bit where it was saying, you know, make things practical, the example it uses is looking at crime figures in the area and plot, <laughs> plotting where crimes have been. God. Uh, uh, that's a really sensitive way of, uh, of talking about where I live. Let's plot all the crime. Oh, no. oh, I must read that. I think, Stan, we should do a little critique of this. I think it might, because I've read a couple of them and... Uh, I have to say I was disappointed um, with the RE one and uh, felt as though if I was a if I was a teacher reading that or a leader reading it, I would really have a bit less. I wouldn't really have moved on in terms of my thinking about what 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 what's required. I think rather than encourage people to say, you know, right, I really need to think about geography in the curriculum. It virtually says, well, if you're not an expert, it's too complex for yeah. you anyway. So we need subject specialists in primaries. We that, don't. That is, it's not going to happen. Specialists of teaching. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what we need in primary. People with pedagogical skills, not necessarily subject skills. That's yeah. my personal view. You may distance yourself from it if what? you wish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was reading uh, Stephen Gorard's book um, about, which actually was a. a um, I think it was a forerunner to the John Hattie work, but he basically did look at a number of um, studies regarding different types of uh, silver bullets, shall we call them? Um, and, and actually sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 the evidence around um, subject knowledge is there, but actually it's over, overstated. You know, it's, it's as if it's, it, it does have, obviously have an impact, but then you've got other factors that, you know, that actually come into play in terms of how you enthuse and, and actually you know uh, excite young people about what geography is and and actually subject knowledge itself is not is not going to do it um and you know but anyway um susan what's caught your eye this week so what's caught my eye has been and i watched it on saturday night was um the tragic um situation that unfolded with Christian Erickson and um, we actually we watched we're watching as a family and my sister-in-law was with us who is a trauma um, uh, doctor and sh she gave us an, a massive insight into how quickly someone should be with him and um, you know thinking oh there has to be somebody there soon there has to be somebody there soon it, it led to a discussion and I thought quite a lot and I, I do feel this passionately that when we're educating we should educate the whole child and what do we want our children to know when they leave our schools and this was a prime example of it we need them to be able to you know to know what to do in that situation or to know where to get help and can we honestly say that the children in our schools do know that? I, you know, that that was what definitely caught my well, eye. Well, what's too. interesting that is when I was teaching in the dark ages, <laughs> in uh, the the instructor at the baths, when the baths were closed, which they frequently were because it was a very old pool, used to come in and do first aid and recovery with the, with the children. So he would he would do resuscitation and everything instead of going swimming. I know it sounds contradictory that, but that that's what we did. And about three or four years ago, uh, somebody collapsed in the street in the evening, and uh, at a party, and somebody came running out to the street saying, "Who can, who can help? Somebody help us! Me dad, me dad, come and help us!" And, and my wife pushed me out of the door saying, "Go and see what you can do." And all the stuff that he'd done with the children came back to me. I was able to, to take this guy, put him in a position ready for resuscitation if, if he needed it. As it happened, he started breathing again. So I was able to put him in a recovery position. Um, and all that was from um, a guy I'm, I'm really grateful to, 
who was like a sergeant major mm. <laughs> in the way things to them like if your dad come on, comes home drunk i know this is sexist but if your dad comes home drunk and he falls asleep on the settee just make sure his head's turned to the side if you get up and see him it's just something that could and those kind of things really stuck with me i'm, I'm sure they stuck with the children as well yeah. but it did used to happen I, i'm not sure how much of it happens now yeah. it, it, i suppose it's what's important isn't it you know we, we've been talking about a geography report there um and actually you know <laughs> You, we're thinking there about priorities and actually it must be a priority that children know how to save somebody's life as opposed to being able to know something about the detail of a geography curriculum you know in a, in a way it's about what is the most important bit in a sort of like a hierarchy and it's quite astounding isn't it yeah. that it's not a requirement for every for every child to be able to do this and also to be able to know how to use a, I don't know if they're a lot well I suspect they will have to use a defibrillator if they're the only person there um yeah, yeah. you know um so you know and I saw on uh, BBC breakfast the other day somebody actually opened a defibrillator and it it, it took you through the process yeah, it um, yeah. yeah. but you know, we were talking after, obviously after the same incident and and we were sort of saying, yeah, you need to get. Where would you get a defibrillator from if it happened in your house? Where's where's the nearest one? And and I was kind of saying, well, they'll have one at the local leisure centre. They've probably got them in the supermarkets. Yeah, but can you imagine driving up there and saying, I need you defibrillator now? <laughs> yeah. What, what, how would that work? And I'm not sure it would work. Yeah. So, do, do all the schools that you are, are chair of, do they have defibrillators, Susan? So, so I, I made those calls that after the weekend and our secondary does, but our primary doesn't. So, um, and you've also, I, I mean, a number of schools have defibrillators, but they're behind locked doors at the weekend or out of hours. Do you know, the, there's that issue. There is. I've done quite a lot of research there's a database where you can look up where your nearest defibrillator is but again under pressure I don't you know you would want to wouldn't you but do you know how how quick is it but I do I do think it's absolutely you know should should be a focus and we can perhaps you know I govern in two RI schools and we can lose sight of that in the you know, raising stand, you know, trying to raise standards and looking Absolutely. at Ofsted may want when actually what's our vision as governors? What do we what do we want our children to come out at the end knowing? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And obviously we want to raise standards. So I'm not saying we don't, but you know, also we don't want to lose sight of uh, these fundamental skills that everyone should know. Yeah. I, um, for me, what caught my eye, because I want to move on, because I think there's um, some stuff here that we could end up missing, because uh, we missed out on the Ofsted sexual harassment report last week, which I think plays into this a little bit. Um, but mine was, uh, I was really pleased, because uh, nothing to do with me, but um, there was a list, uh, a, a paper re released this week by the DfE, which indicated the proportion of children being taught in good and outstanding schools around the country. And of course, Blackpool, um, you would expect to be somewhere down towards the bottom of that list, but um, there were 300 or so local areas in that list and uh, um, Blackpool came 117th from the bottom out of 312 or so. But actually what was so remarkable was that it, where, I, where Susan and I live in Stockport, Stockport performed worse than Blackpool as did Eastbourne. Um, and, I, and, and all I'm trying to do is just try and change the narrative around these places that there, you know, that it's, it's, there is a sort of like an, a, at times a bit of an arrogance about the fact that, and, and there are parts of Stockport that Susan and I know very well, where virtually every school is outstanding. And there's a bit of an arrogance about that, that, well, you know, but actually we're not really playing the same game here, folks, you know, and actually to achieve an outstanding judgment in Blackpool, I tell you, is, is remarkable um it's not just outstanding it is truly remarkable and and i just credit to all those blackpool heads who have you know driven hard to to improve performance in their schools and to try to do it in it without having to take the silver bullets that are sent from whitehall every now and again 
Um, so well done to them. Can we can we just Susie, move on? Go on, Susie, you're going to say. I was just going to briefly say that, as I said, two RI schools that I'm chair of. And, you know, it is that that being in an RI school, you have to do so much more, do you know, so much more. You don't have, you know, to be good. You can't sit and say you're good. You actually have to produce outstanding work in your school all the time even to reach that good and I think you know that's obviously credit to Blackpool because they must have to do that absolutely. Yeah, that's a very interesting point though isn't it Stan about having to achieve outstanding yeah. outcomes in order to get over the RI boundary. Yeah. It goes back to something that we spoke about last week when um, um, Barry was saying to me, oh, you must have been a very courageous head. And I said, no, in a school where you're getting decent results um, because you've got a good intake, amongst other things, you've got good teachers, you can take those risks and you can be confident and you can say we're going to do this despite what everybody else says. But when you're in RI or, or in a lower level than RI, you really genuinely don't think you can take those risks. Yeah. 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 And I understand that. It's not it's not so I'm not condemning anybody who won't take the risks. I think I, I'd be in the same position. I taught in inner city Salford and I, I wouldn't see me under those pressures being able to to take the risks that I took when we were in a, a nice middle class area. I, I have to say though that I'm not convinced that all the schools that are RI are RI and all no, the schools that are good are good, you know, and, and I'm I have I, I my confidence in Ofsted's ability to to know where those boundary lines are I mean I think a lot of that has been we've been talking today about knowledge I think that there there is when we were inspecting Stan there was no preferred practice you know there is preferred oh. practice now isn't there if that geography report is anything to go by there is preferred practice emanating all over the show and that means that schools have to play the preferred practice card much more often than perhaps they'd want to, simply in order to satisfy those people who are driving a preferred practice approach, you know. So I, I feel really uh, disappointed. I, 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 I'm, you know, in a way, I, I feel as though I've, I trick myself into thinking that I have greater confidence in, in Ofsted judgments than, than actually is the case. Since yeah, I've, but even, even in our time, Frank, there was a, a kind of uh, sense check that went on uh, which I didn't agree with at all, which was, well, what did the last HMI who visited the school thought of it? And yeah. if they said, no, it's not a good school, then no matter what you'd found, you were going to really struggle to say that this is a good school. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there was an element of, you know, you might, you might know your stuff and the framework might be good and you may have done it all with, with an evidence base, but it still doesn't trump the judgment of somebody who went in for half a day three years ago <laughs> and made, made a judgment. Susan, can, can I move on to that Ofsted report then? I mean, have you had a chance to, to consider it? And, yeah, you know, yeah. and what, what's yeah. your sort of reaction to it? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm going to talk about it at both my full governor's meetings this term because it's so important. Um, I was horrified to read that when they went in, only just over a quarter of governors had had safeguarding training from that point of view, just as a starter. Do you know, I, I just <laughs> I just can't believe it. And my worry is, is the quality of that training. If that training is just read keeping children safe in education and tick your box, then, you know, I don't think we're doing um, well enough. No. And and it, ha and it and again, that has to come, the vision of the school. What, what sort of school do we want? And we can't hide from issues like this. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm gonna go jump back a bit. So, so ignore this, if you like, Frank, to, to press on. But what you've just said there about what kind of school, uh, I have a big thing about the culture of schools and the difference that makes to children and, you know, not only in their academic success, but in their life skills and, and their relationships and, and everything else. And yet, as far as I can see, there's never been anything that's judged the quality of, of the school in terms of its culture. You know, that, that you know, 
ask parents what they want most of all in schools and the surveys that have been done say we want our children to be happy yeah. that, that's the top of the list every time and yet there's no real test of does this school run a happy school are the children progressing because they're enjoying them you know, all those kind of things that i think is really important in the school mm. yet it's not on it's not in the framework i i think for me when i when i read the report from Ofsted, i and i felt for, I, I have to say it's a it is a well crafted um report in nearly every i couldn't you know dispute it yeah um obviously they'd they'd done that they'd gone out there they'd actually done a fairly a very very deep dive speaking to young people but the two things that troubled me were the first was there was a sense of well Ofsted you've been visiting schools since 1992 and you still continue to visit schools on a very regular basis but I haven't been reading this this has not been an issue that young people have felt able to raise with you, or if they have, you've not reported it. So, and the way that Ofsted sort of pushed that out of the report, that I think there's some really serious questions about Ofsted, but Ofsted's never good at writing about itself in a negative way. You know, I think I would have respected the inspectorate more if it said, you know, to be honest, you know, we this is quarters on the, you know, on the hop, you know. Uh, because in a way, anybody anybody trying to defend this, as as Amanda Spielman tried to do in the Education Select Committee, you know, really, you know, should should really be pretty humble about what they're saying. And I just feel as though they find that very very difficult to to write critically about their own work. And the other thing was around um, the fact that even though that I think there was somewhere in the region of two or three thousand schools in there, many of which were independent schools. And um, we must remember there are 26,000 or so schools in, the, in, in England. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, and, and this is a very well publicized website and, and a campaign. You know, there are many, many schools where I'm not suggesting this doesn't happen, but it, if it does happen, it's managed and dealt with really effectively. And I think that there is a sense that this is, this is a problem in every single school. It may be, but it's actually, I think the way it's managed and going back to standpoint around culture, means that it may be that there's a lot of learning here that actually some schools are managing this better than others. And I didn't get a feeling of that when I read the report. Mm. So, you know, I think there's a, I'm not wanting, I'm, and that's not to say this is not happening. And if it happened, you know, to my grandchildren or whatever, I would be horrified. And, you know, this is, this for me is a serious issue, but actually I think that there's a little bit of uh, lack of balance, I think somewhere in the report. Yeah, I, I do think it's that, isn't it? The narrative appears to be, and, and absolutely, do you know, if, you, if your school's name doesn't appear on that list, you shouldn't be sitting back, back thinking it's right. okay. Um, but on the other hand, as you say, Frank, it could be that this is being dealt with. Yeah, really well. I, I mean, the, the thing is also is that there were multiple, I mean, there are multiple um, rampant number of um, referrals from, a number of very high, uh, uh, well, we use the word high performing or or sort of independent schools, you know, select independent schools. But actually, you know, that, that it's it's amazing how little attention has been given to that, you know, and actually uh, the fact that 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 website had so many um, submissions from um, young people on you know, hitting the same schools. Um, you know, it's, it's, it is remarkable that the independent schools inspectorate, you know, um, you know they, they I, I have to say, I'm not sure that they can come out of this saying that they're actually, their independence is actually producing secure evaluations of safety in their schools, you know, and, and it's not some Ofsted only quality assures that work it, and it doesn't do many visits. So actually this independent schools inspectorate, which will do places like Stockport Grammar, Cheadle Hume, places like that, you know, that 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 really has to, you have to, and there's a lot of peer inspection work going on there. You know, you have to question whether or not that actually is fit for purpose. Um, that, if we can now move then to what's it been like being a governor during the lockdown, I think we've all been doing that, haven't we, in one form or other. Yeah. Susan, what, 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 what have you, how have things changed for you um, during lockdown as a chair? Um, well, 
do you know it's that challenge and support isn't it and um you know went much more on the support side uh everything changed we had to think and you know good conversations about you know are are the requirements on our senior leaders and the things we're asking them to produce are are they actually necessary and, and moving on will we still be asking for that same information um I think, you know, we've we've all obviously got used to virtual meetings, sometimes better than others. Um, that has produced a clarity and, um, you know, uh, we've uh, been able to focus on issues. Uh, and maybe we felt a bit more able to go off piste in a way. I, I had a meeting last night where we just basically abandoned the agenda and just spoke about one issue, do you know? And we, we felt able to do that because we felt as though that was the important thing for the school at the time. Um, but definitely the challenge and support, I've actually become chair of these two schools during the last year. All so right. that's that's been very interesting as I've had to get to know people virtually um, and, uh, you know, and that's been a steep learning curve. But, um, yeah, it, it has been very different, very hard for governors. And, uh, you know, and, and I have been quite eloquent on Twitter about that, saying, you know, I, I mean, completely just the whole of education but please include governors in that because um you know it has been a struggle for them too yeah, yeah. But what I, what i found that with the the technology i mean we we've we've met over the pandemic obviously through zoom and and the like but now we're talking about when we're back face to face but it does mean for people who can't make the meeting yeah. we're now talking about a way they can join the meeting if physically they're not in the area and that will now seem far more normal yeah. than it ever did. I mean, no one, if, if you were away working somewhere and you would just give your apologies and nobody would say, well, can't, can't, you, can't we link you by um, computer? That would just have been beyond anyone's thinking. And now that's an automatic. Well, can you not get to a computer? Because it doesn't matter where you are if you can get onto a link. And we're now talking about using the classroom with its whiteboard to bring in a governor who perhaps can't be physically present, which I think is a real strength. It's, it's interesting though that um, I know that companies though that have gone to this sort of hybrid, you know, you can be in the room or you can't be. When it, when they've come around to big decision make decisions and there've been discussions, those people that have been online have felt at a disadvantage to those that have been in the room together. So you know because yeah. There's all that sort of stuff that you can get across with a little nudge and a little, you know, sort of a look, which you can't do on on this. So some businesses are actually saying we're either one or the other. There's, there is the possibility of of them both working. But actually, you know, if we're going to make big decisions, then those decisions either have to be made by people who are always virtual or on virtual or face to face. That doesn't mean to say the mundane stuff can happen. In a hybrid way the big yeah. decisions need yeah. to be either in the room or out of the room i agree there's a lot more nuance when you're in a meeting because you can see body language you can see people's facial expressions when they don't necessarily agree with what's being said you can pick up all that. I, I fully agree all i'm thinking it's it's a solution to to somebody being present in the meeting who wouldn't have been otherwise and I, yeah I, I do think face to face will be the way to do things in future. Yeah. Except yeah. I'll now no longer consider going to Stoke or or to London to have a conversation with somebody that I can have over the the internet. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I mean, um, Susan, with regard to your relationship with the head teachers, I mean, are you are you still having those sort of fairly regular catch ups with them? And you know, yeah. and and and. and how have you coped when they've felt down? You know, I mean, because actually you would normally do that, you know, with a coffee and a chat and whatever. And and that has been interesting. And it's always my first 
thing I say is, how are you? And we always get that out first. And, it, you know, head teachers, who'd, who'd be a head teacher <laughs> at the moment? <laughs> You know, I mean, absolutely, it is. It has been really tough, and it has. You know, we've still been able. We, I have managed to do some face to face with both my heads, um, and we've appreciated that. And the fact that we've done some has mean that meant that virtual's been easier then as well. But you know, it it is it is harder to have that sort of picking up on the vibes. Um, yeah. when things really aren't going well and when the pressure is on um, I, I can't wait to get back face to face because I've got two boards that I've only ever met as little squares <laughs> on a, on a I think the concern I have is that they might because uh, I'm a trustee uh, of um, of a trust in East Manchester and and actually I've, I've not visited any of the schools and I've been a trustee nearly for getting on for two years and uh um well it's probably 20 months or so i think so the thing is is that i without actually knowing or, or getting a sense of what the school feels like actually i'm not entirely sure how confident i am about what i'm hearing you know what i mean They're, you're not able to triangulate the the evidence you've got somebody says oh you know well actually it's everything's fine you know we're, we're coping a bubble's gone down we're we're a, but we're, we're in managing it but actually, I think I'd need to see that uh, and get a feel of the atmosphere in the school before I started to really believe it. Yeah. yeah. So it's picking up on your points, Dan, isn't it? Yeah. It, it's. I, I. I just think there's 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 things that have happened that have been a great advantage over this this year. Obviously, there's been enormous challenges. We got as governors, we got a message from uh, the head teacher of a primary school saying. I'm just letting you know I'll be doing nothing strategic over the next few weeks. Well, you know, I don't want you to feel as though I'm not keeping you up to date with strategic matters. We're not doing that. Uh, we, you know, we've didn't say we're virtually firefighting, but but that's what was happening. We're dealing with the day to day, and and I think as a, as a governor, being pragmatic over this last year has been been the most important thing, and supporting decisions where you might in the past have said well just you know what about <laughs> you just have to think I, i'm not in the middle of this and i've never been in anything as a head like that so let's just trust the people who we trust normally to deal with it and 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 get it sorted and it's been great to be able to thank the staff um and in the school the whole staff for for what they've done i mean i remember going I think I took some some bottle a bottle into the admin staff, or several bottles, Frank. Just before you say one bottle between the whole admin staff, uh, to say thank you for the first day when they worked when 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 the schools closed and we had to find out which children could come in and couldn't. They were on the phone till gone six at night, ringing people to just double check that they were entitled to send the children in, uh, and I have to say a significant proportion weren't entitled to send the children in but it was the admin staff who dealt with all that um, and I just thought that that commitment in that team tells me something about the culture of the school that I'm a governor at and, and that to me is a, is a strength a real strength yeah and I think that you know the the actions of people during this time has really you know I, I still say brought out the best in people and you know both my schools they we've had you know senior members of staff going out with laptops but not just with laptops you know with food with um you know checking people are okay if they haven't been in touch and you know the, the safeguarding side of that and the care has just been phenomenal to see and that has has made me feel better, I suppose, not being able to be in the schools, but I know what type of institution they are then from knowing that. You know, and, do you, uh, and actually, Susan, just to finish, are they good schools? Um, <laughs> they are absolutely wonderful schools, yeah. although Ofsted <laughs> say that they are both RI, but, you know, they, I, th I think if you came in to see them... Absolutely. Um, be very welcome to do you would think that they were amazing schools yeah great yeah. leadership yeah well that's a that's a nice way to end uh this week's uh video cast so uh can i thank you susan for joining us uh, 
No, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, uh, thank you, Stan. And next week, we, as I say, we have uh, Emma Ainsworth, um, somebody I've known for a, uh, a little while, who is a, a, a young sort of uh, business leader who is a, um, a real inspiration. So uh, we'll be talking about leadership, I think, next week, ethical leadership next week, Stan. So uh, and who knows what's going to happen this week? Who knows? <laughs> It's never dull in education. Okay, well, I'll see you all next week and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye.